A tax freight train is bearing down on your retirement. To protect yourself, you'll have to harness the power of zero. Hey folks, welcome to the Power of Zero show. This is your host, best-selling author, David McKnight. I'm the author of Power of Zero. Look before you lurk the volatility shield and tax-free income for life, all of which can be bought in single copies at Amazon or wherever you buy fine books or in bulk discounts at davidmcknightbooks.com. If you're looking for someone to help you navigate all the pitfalls that stand between you and the 0% tax bracket, head on over to davidmcknight.com. We're happy to connect you with a member of our elite POZ advisor group, trained, vetted, qualified personally by me. And if you are a financial advisor who wants to become a member of our elite POZ advisor group, you can head over to powerzero.com. We are happy to have a chat with you. Okay, today we are going to be uh, listening to the uh, second half of my wide-ranging interview with Mark Bilek of Attleboro Financial. He is a member of our elite POZ advisor group. So if you want to get a feel for the quality of the advisors in our elite POZ advisor group, take a listen to what Mark has to say on some of these things. Uh, today, today, we're going to talk about when we think capital gains are going to go up, the value of permanent life insurance, the value of the LIRP, how to spend down your taxable bucket in the right way, and what are the different instruments you can use to do so. We're going to talk about the importance of mitigating long-term care risks and what's the best way to go about doing that. We're going to talk about how quickly we believe tax rates will go up, and we're going to talk a little bit about a perfect storm that we believe is going to be arriving right at about 2030. We're going to talk about Irma considerations when doing Roth conversions. Uh, we're going to talk about which of all my books you should read first and in which order. And we're going to give you a preview of my new book, The Infinity Code, which will be coming out in the next couple of months. So sit back, relax, enjoy the second half of my interview with Mark Pilek. I've got a question here. The person asks, is it better to sell a property that has gone up in value from 100000 to 300000 now or wait until when the tax rate is lower? So I'll take that one if you don't mind, Dave. It's going to depend on what your situation is. You know, there, first of all, I don't know when taxes are ever going to be lower. But unless your specific circumstance says, I make $400,000 in my job and I'm retiring next year and I'm going to have a lull in income and suddenly your income is going to drop to $25,000 a year. So that, that's a very specialized thing. The other thing is when you're talking about selling a property, so I'm, I'm hearing real estate. Um, or some other kind of hard asset, you may have embedded losses or something like that in your tax history that you can use to offset those, or you may have a loss in another area. So that's a really good um, question that you can flesh out in financial planning session. I'm going to ask Gerard. Gerard's one of our financial experts who's often on our webinar. So uh, Gerard asked, how does means testing enter into the conversation regarding taxes and social security future benefits. You want to take that, Dave? Yeah. I mean, there's social security is not the big issue in my mind. It's Medicare. Medicare is five times more expensive. And that's really what's going to be driving most of the debt over time. If all Congress does is nothing, the national debt will, by definition, grow just because more and more Americans will move on to the roles of, you know, social security, Medicare, but, but Medicare is the big beast, right? Social security is a relatively easy fix. You can move back the retirement age, the first year, which you can withdraw benefits for young people like me and me and Mark. That's a relatively easy fix. Means testing could certainly enter into the equation like it does in other countries. So it, it's going to be probably a combination of means testing on younger folks like Mark and I, or moving the age at which you qualify for social security back until say age 72. I mean, if you look back at when you could draw Social Security back in 1935, when Social Security first rolled out, it was age 65, back when the average life expectancy was 62. Now the average life expectancy is 77 for you know, men, 79 for women. And when can you draw Social Security? Well, it's age 62. And so they haven't really adjusted that in almost 100 years. And so I see that being a natural, you know, a natural evolution. But it doesn't really, it's like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. It doesn't really solve the problem. They're going to have to figure out how to negotiate Medicare. That is the thing that increases by 6% per year uh, on average over time. And we got 10,000 baby boomers per day that move out of the workforce onto the roles of Social Security and ultimately Medicare. Medicare is such an expensive animal that it will be sort of controlling the destiny of our country. And so 
I worry less about what's going to happen to Social Security and more about how we're going to afford to pay for Medicare over time. Yeah, good answer, Dave. You're spot on there. All right, Diane asks, I was told by my accountant that the amount you can put in a Roth IRA in 2022 and annually is going to be limited. Is this true? Well, Diane, it is limited. So, and it's also, that's means tested as far as how much you can contribute based on your earnings. So you can pull, if you, again, Diane, if you go to our website, outofourwealth.com and go into that slot corner and you can see exactly how much you can contribute to a Roth IRA. Now, if you're talking about conversions, and that's often confused, then there's no limit on conversions right now. There's discussion about that, but you can convert as little or as much as you'd like. I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you this uh, because this is from a client of, mine, of ours. So I'm sure he wants to hear from you because he's heard from me a lot, Dave. So any thoughts on where capital gains are heading? No doubt they will increase, but what is the general consensus out there? You know, it almost depends entirely on who's in office. If you have uh, Democrats that control the presidency, the House and the Senate, they're almost certainly going to try to raise them. Republicans tend to feel like high capital gains taxes stymie the growth of the economy. And so they're more reticent to, to make that type of a move, even in the face of spiraling, you know, the spiraling debt crisis. So uh, sadly, it has less to do with math and more to do with who's in office. It's looking like come midterms that Republicans are going to, there's going to be a sort of this red wave that rolls through the House and through Senate, which means that that Biden's going to be sort of a lame duck for the last two years of his first term. Uh, And then we'll see what happens in 2024. So it's tough to say, but my wish that these things were more tied to the actual fiscal trajectory of our country and less tied to, you know, political majorities in the House and Senate. But that's the reality that we're facing. And the reason why we have $30 trillion of debt is because politicians are more concerned about getting reelected than they are about what the debt's going to be two years from now when they're not even sure if they're going to be in office at that point. So, But if you look purely at the math of it all, capital gains taxes were going to have to rise precipitously or along with individual income tax rates or we're going to go broke as a country. Yeah, and I know you talk about that a lot in your in all your books, Dave. And look before you LARP talks a lot about the vehicle that people can use to invest in that avoid capital gains tax because that's a runaway freight train as well. You know, when I was brought up in working at UBS and Wachovia, which became Wells Fargo, I was taught that whole life and permanent insurance was bad, right? Invest it or buy term and invest the rest. You know, another awakening I had was learning from Ed, learning from you about really the value of permanent insurance and using that that tax-free nature of life insurance for those vehicles. So I'm not here trying to sell anybody on life insurance, but you take away that risk, right? That tax rate, that increased tax rate risk by using a vehicle like that. And you know, you say it all the time, David, in your book and everywhere else, there's only two things that are truly tax-free and that's Roth IRA and the, the life insurance. You know, I call them cash value life insurance. You call them life insurance retirement plans, but you know, someone asked about the Roth IRA and we can, and will that ever go away? And we know that there are limits we, on what we can contribute to our Roth IRAs or 401ks. There are uh, no limits on conversions right now. So we move a lot of IRA money and we talk about how to stack it up in our marginal tax rates and kind of, you know, have a strategic plan to move that over. But what, what about that taxable money? I, if I have a million, two, whatever sitting in that taxable bucket, is there anything other than that life insurance that will give us the protection that we need from the tax rates? Well, I always tell people, you don't have to love life insurance. You don't have to love life insurance companies. You just have to like them a little bit more than you like the IRS because in the end, someone's going to get your money. So, you know, people that have these inherent prejudices against life insurance, I say, all right, well, you know, your capital gains are going to be taxed at your highest marginal, if they're short-term capital gains, to be taxed at your highest marginal tax rate, right on top of all your other income, which means that if you, if your money grew at 8%, it's going to feel like it only grew at 5%. So that 3% that goes to pay for taxes over time, that's going to, that's going to be a drag. There's going to be an opportunity cost associated with that. And so the average expenses per year over the life of a, a cash value life insurance policy are between one and one and a half percent, which is not all that different than what you're paying in, a, say, a, a 401k or, or a brokerage account or what have you. And so 
know, I tell people, whatever road you take in life, somebody's making one to one and a half percent off of your money. The question is, what are you getting in exchange for that one to one and a half percent? And with the life insurance, I really like to, to note that you're, you are getting a death benefit in exchange for those fees that you are paying. And that death benefit doubles as long-term care. And I tell people all the time, people aren't opposed to having long-term care insurance or just opposed to paying for it. So if you just simply take dollars that would have otherwise been uh, sub subject to the one to one and a half percent fee that you might pay to your 401k provider or maybe to a money manager, and you shift a portion of that money into a, what I call a life insurance retirement plan, it's essentially a bucket of money with a spigot attached to the side of it. And the cost of those expenses on average per year over the life of the program are going to be one to one and a half percent. You're actually getting something useful in exchange for that money. And it's, like I said, it's a death benefit that doubles this long-term care. And frankly, people uh, have a lot of, there's a lot of heartburn associated with traditional long-term care insurance. And Mark, if you don't mind, I'm going to share a quick dialogue yeah, that sure. I have with my own clients. And, and it goes something like this. I'll be sitting across the table from him. I'll say, Mr. Jones, you know, I love you, right? And he'll say, yeah, Dave, I know you love me. And I'll say, I, I do love you, but you're better off dying than needing long-term care. I'll say, why is that? I'll say, well, at least if you died, Mrs. Jones here is beneficiary in all your accounts. And while we would miss you terribly, life for her is going to go along relatively unchanged. However, if you didn't die and ended up needing long-term care, you know, you almost died, then all of the money that she was planning on living on now goes now gets earmarked to, for the uh, long-term care facility. Uh, and she gets to keep what? One house, one car, a minimum monthly maintenance needs allowance, about $2,500 a month and about $130,000 of cash. So it was shaping up to be a perfectly rosy retirement for Mrs. Jones turns into basic bare bones subsistence type living. And of course, the converse is true if Mrs. Jones ended up needing long-term care. And so this is a real issue because you can burn through a, a lifetime of savings in three years or less if you end up needing long-term care. And so one of the benefits of the LIRP is uh, instead of, you know, like traditional long-term care insurance where you pay, 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 pay for 30 years, die peaceful in your sleep, never having used it, and they don't send your money back at the end. The way the LIRP works is that should you die peaceful in your sleep 30 years from now, never having needed long-term care, someone's still getting a death benefit, probably your children. So there isn't that sensation of having paid for something without ever using it. By the way, all that cash value that builds along the way grows tax-free, grows safely and productively, and you get to withdraw tax-free at a period in your life when tax rates are likely to be dramatically higher than they are today. Says we're in our early 60s and have been fortunate to save uh, several million dollars for our retirement years. Good for you. <clears throat> Unfortunately, 70% of it is in taxable accounts, 25% in tax deferred accounts, and only 5% in tax free accounts. So we have no chance to make it to the 0% tax bracket. I'm not sure about that, but we will still want to do what we can to reduce the tax plate over the next few decades. So, two questions. We started doing annual Roth conversions, but only up to the income limit for the 24% bracket. Expecting that taxes will increase in 2026, should we move more into Roth IRAs over the next four years, even though we'd be paying taxes at 32% or stick with moving the most we can up to the 24% bracket limit? So why don't we stop there and you can answer that. And we, we did talk about this. Yeah, already. yeah. We talked a little bit about this already. I'm a fan of extending that Roth, Roth conversion period beyond 2026. I, I tend to think that in the medium term, the tax rates are going to stay relatively stable. Of course, I'm, I'm looking into my crystal ball. Everybody's crystal ball looks a little bit different. So I would much rather pay, you know, the 22, 24% tax rates up until 2026, 2026 and beyond pay 25 and 28, as opposed to preemptively paying the 32. But again, this is a subjective type of a thing. It's what, you know, how quickly do you think tax rates will go up? Ed Slot is just like, they're going to go up in 2022. And I'm like, I, I'm not so sure. I think that it's more of a gradual sort of a thing. And so that's, that. I would be more inclined to stretch that obligation out over a longer period of time. I would say definitely get it done before 2030 because there's going to be something, there's going to be a perfect storm that hits our country in 2030. You definitely want to get all your heavy lifting done before 2030 because there's going to be some crazy stuff coming down in 2030 between demographics and debt and unfunded obligations, it's all gonna hit in 2030. You wanna get your house in order before that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, and, and what I was talking about before about going into the 
bracket. I'll tell you that that is few and far between for us. What we see, and it, this may not be that this person's situation because they have would think is, and what I've experienced is probably more uncommon, right? 75% of their money in taxable, 20 or 70% of in taxable, 25% in tax deferred. We tend to see a lot of people with most of their money in tax deferred. And and some sometimes it's significant. Sometimes it's three, four, $5 million. So there is just no way on earth that we can transfer that, that amount of money by 2026. So now we're seeing schedules going out to 2033, 2035. And like you just said, Dave, when we go out past 20, 29, 20, 30, that's where I start getting concerned. And I have a conversation with our clients that says, how aggressive do you want to be, right? What's your comfort level in going up a little higher? And where does your concern really lie? The future of, of a much higher tax rate or paying that additional tax now? Now, I agree with you. I think it's going to be a more gradual slope, right? It won't be a rocket ship, but it's going to be pretty aggressive. So great answer. Thank you. Um, Diane asks, uh, 100% of our retirement is tax deferred. We just did a Roth conversion in 2021 that pushed us into the 32% bracket. What we struggled with is the increased IRMA for Medicare. We went into a higher IRMA bracket. Was that a smart move? So Dave, if you want to start on that, I want to finish sure. on that. Don't sure. Mind. Yeah. I mean, there's a, couple, there's a couple of things that might have touched a nerve for me. The first one is bouncing into the 32% tax bracket. We've already talked about whether that's right. something you should consider. The second thing that, that people do wince over is just that IRMA. And remember, there's an increase in IRMA for the husband and there's an increase in IRMA for the spouse, mm -hmm. and that can really add up. But it's sort of a trade-off. You have to say, okay, I am paying my IRMA, an increased IRMA in the short term to spare my IRAs and my social security from higher taxation over the long term. Remember, if you leave your money in your IRAs, any required minimum distributions are going to count as provisional income and dramatically increase the likelihood that you're, you pay Social Security taxation in perpetuity. So if you can get to the 0% tax bracket in retirement by shifting most of your assets to tax-free, you put yourself in a position where not only will you not pay IRM anymore, but you won't pay Social Security tax anymore, and you will shield yourself from the impact of tax rate risk down the road. So yeah, it hurts a little bit in the short term, but there's a triple benefit in the long term. No Social Security tax, no IRMA, and shielding yourself from higher tax rates down the road. Yeah, it, you know, you're right, Dave, and just IRMA alone. So all those other things count 100%. But we've done this. We have a spreadsheet we use comparison because what happens, Diane, is you keep if you keep your money in into the, your traditional IRAs, you're going to be triggering that IRMA anyway, and it's going to it, it's just going to grow and grow and grow. So we take a spreadsheet and we say, okay, what if what if we do Roth Roth conversions and we're doing IRMA for the next five years or seven years? Right? There's that two year overhang. It's, there's a two year look back on it, or Irma doesn't kick in until year nine, let's just say, for example, and now you pay that forever. And by the way, that's under today's rules. You're subject to the increases that we just don't know about, the big question mark. I have to tell you, I've ran these, I can't tell you how many times, I've never seen it where it doesn't work out better to pay the Irma now, just like to do the Roth conversions now, to pay the tax now. Because first of all, we know what the cost is, right? So known cost has a tremendous value, but even so, and often it's, $85,000, $100,000 difference in doing the IRMA now. So while it may make you uncomfortable, it's worth the exercise of showing that side-by-side -side comparison on that. And listen, folks, these comparisons that you do or that we do for, for folks, they have to be done all the time. It's important. We do it at first to educate your show, but when we're doing our annual financial planning for clients, it's often a re-education because you've had 40 plus years of tax deferred investing is the way to go. Don't, you know, don't pay your tax until you have to all these. And so you often we have to show and we do every year the value of these things. And that's important. So you've got to review your plan every year and you've got to just get in the right mindset every year. It's really easy to get back in those comfortable ways. And then you're reacting to everything and things you can no longer control. You can control it now. Dave, I want to talk about your books and give you an opportunity to talk about your new book because it sounds really exciting. Dave, uh, you know, he's best-selling author, but he has. Uh, I'm going to just leave the floor to him to talk about his books and his new book coming out because I can't wait to read it. Go ahead. 
Am I talking about all four or just the... Whatever just you'd the, like. Okay. Okay. Well, um, really, really, the power zero is the one that started it all. I wrote that back in 2013. Basically, the book, that book is designed to, number one, convince you that tax rates in the future are likely to be dramatically higher than they are today, educates you on the three basic types of money, the three basic types of buckets, how in a rising tax rate environment, there's a mathematically perfect amount of money to have in your taxable and tax deferred buckets. And then anything above and beyond those ideal amounts should be systematically repositioned and tax-free. We make the case that 0% tax bracket's a really big deal because if tax rates double, like a lot of experts predict, two times zero is still zero. I then wrote a book called Look Before You Lerp, which is a play on the phrase, look before you leap, which is what we say before someone gets married. And I basically say, hey, look, uh, when you use an LIRP as part of your comprehensive strategy to get to the 0% tax bracket, not all LIRPs are created equal And that, hey, when you were thinking about getting married, you probably had a laundry list of attributes you were looking for in a spouse. You know, maybe you were attracted to them. Maybe you were same religion. Maybe you're going in the same direction, same values, those types of things. When you are thinking about entering into the LIRP contract, you should have a list of seven or eight things on your laundry list that you're looking for in an LIRP because LIRPs only really work if it's till death do you part. And in some cases, they're 40, 50 year propositions. You want to make sure that your LIRP has every single one of those attributes that I list in my book, Look Before You Lerp. So that's sort of a guide on selecting an LIRP mate, as it were. And then I wrote a book called The Volatility Shield, sort of a heartwarming story about how to eliminate various risks from your retirement. And then the one that I wrote uh, most recently, Tax-Free Income for Life, makes the case that the single greatest risk, according to retirees and pre-retirees, in your retirement is much to my chagrin. It's not, hey, tax rate risk. It's the risk of running out of money before you run out of life. And so I make the case that there's a couple of different ways to purge longevity risk, which is what we call it, or the risk of living too long, outliving your money. There's a couple of different ways to purge longevity risk from your retirement portfolio. I make the case that one of the mathematically most efficient ways is to use what we call a guaranteed lifetime income, which basically says, hey, as long as you're on this side of the grass, you basically hand a chunk of your liquid retirement savings to an insurance company, and they give you, in exchange, a promise that you'll receive a stream of income every day until you die. The problem is, historically, most advisors situate those those annuities within the tax deferred bucket, which exposes them to two risks, expose them to tax rate risk and the risk of social security taxation. I make the case that there are certain types of annuities that have what's called a piecemeal internal Roth conversion, which allows you to do a, a Roth conversion on that annuity so that by the time that Roth conversion is complete, you can pull money out of that annuity 100% tax-free and it, it, it dramatically increases the likelihood that you'll get your social security tax-free uh, as long as you're alive as well. So that's how you can eliminate tax rate risk and longevity risk within the very same financial plan. It sort of rounds out the entire power of zero uh, worldview. And then I got a new book uh, coming out in the next couple months. It's called The Infinity Code. It's a 75,000 word novel. It's got some financial undertones. I, it's about a shadowy cabal of Harvard graduates, graduated in 1985, who are planning to sort of institute a, a new world order in the United States by radically redefining the U.S. monetary system. And I talk about a Harvard sophomore who unwittingly becomes aware of their plot and has to, in a race against the clock, has to foil their plan before, before their plan, you know, goes past the point of no return. So it's a really exciting Dan Brown sort of suspense thriller with a very important monetary theme that is incredibly relevant and it's almost ripped right from the headlines, incredibly relevant to our, you know, our current plight. And so that'll come out in the next couple of months and hopefully be a good change of pace from the, you know, the business books that I typically write. That's exciting. Will that be published by the time we see you in April, the, your new book, do you think? Yeah, this is the interesting part. I have to convince my literary agent that I'm good at writing novels, not just at writing business books. So I'm in the process of trying to convince him to shop it around to some of, you know, Penguin Random House type publishers. If not, I might have to find a smaller publisher. That may take a little bit of time, but it's just sorting that part out. It'll take some time. So no no promises, but certainly if it is done by then, we'll we'll have some copies on hand. 
Okay, folks, that is the second half of my interview with Mark Bialik. If you're looking for help navigating all of these pitfalls that stand between you and the 0% tax bracket, head over to davidmcknight.com and we will connect you with a member of our elite POZ advisor group, just like Mark, trained, vetted, qualified personally by me. If you are a financial advisor, uh, you can head over to powerzero.com and opt into the three-part video series. We'll be happy to have a chat with you. I would love a follow on Twitter. It's at McKnight and Co, at McKnight and Co, or Instagram, David C. McKnight. And again, you can buy any of my books in bulk at davidmcknightbooks.com. Thank you folks for listening in, and we will look forward to chatting with you same time next week. 